Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for your, for your introduction to my CV. I intended to, to pick up, to start with my CV, if you don't mind. Uh, let me tell you that I've been working for more than 40 years in the industry, apart from some holidays here and there, and uh, I can roughly divide my professional life in four decades. You know, the first decade, in fact, I started with research and development and then working in the Exxon Group, where I learned a lot. The second decade, I worked with Petrolius Venezuela, so from uh, EOC, from research and development, from a, a clear international oil company to a national oil company. So I worked for more than a decade effectively uh, with Petrolius Venezuela. Then the, another decade, I worked in actually a, as a, either a board member or a CEO with three partnerships between EOC and NOX, one with BP, BP and Petroleum de Venezuela, 50-50, another with Petroleum de Venezuela and Weber Oil, called Ruhr Oil in Germany, and another Nines Petroleum, a partnership between Petroleum de Venezuela and Neste Hoy. So I've, I've lived nearly a decade uh, managing or being part of the top management of uh, a 50-50 partnership between Yox and Knox. My fourth decade of work, and I'm skipping my fantastic days in, in, the, in the brewing and beverage industry, um, I, I basically, this fourth decade, I um, had the privilege to run the Portuguese oil and gas company, named now Galp Energia, which has had many names throughout its history. And, um, and I took basically this company from a state-controlled state company, so a NOC, if you prefer it, but a NOC based on the market, uh, into what is today a YOC, so a total international oil company w without the, 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 although still the government has certain financial investment in the company, but no, no other uh, rights other than uh, a very minor investor. So that's, so I, I feel myself privileged to touch the point of the relationships between Knox and Yox and the hybrids because I've, I've worked through, through, this, through this process throughout many, many years. Then I'm going to tell you what I was told by whoever prepared in the company this presentation for me, what I should say, and I will conclude saying what I really want to say. Uh, so starting with that, I, I really, we all know that, uh, that uh, the creation of Knox was basically around the 60s, 70s, uh, and we all know, so I just leave this for records, that it was, uh, that, uh, it was on that decade that the countries that had natural resources uh, really uh, awoke for the need of, um, of, um, of controlling their destiny and controlling their natural resources and originated the, the, the wave of nationalizations and then the creation of, of national oil companies. Uh, we all know too that uh, the reserves of oil today, in oil and gas, are mostly located in, in, in controlled by NOCs which was totally the opposite to what happened in the 70s. If you see that, uh, that uh, pie on the right-hand side, you see that, but that is of full knowledge to everyone. What uh, uh, one of my junior colleagues told me is she went to the, to the, to the sites of the companies and tried to read uh, and simply print in a, in a page uh, the mission of the NOC Yoks, as they are written by themselves, and the following one will refer to the mission of the, of the NOCs. Um, I'm going to look at the common denominator of the missions of the IOCs. And all of them uh, basically talk about, uh, talk about the a mission, they, w they work to meet the world's energy growing demand, to deliver the energy to the world, to meet the world's energy needs. These are the statements that are to, to, uh, to whatever, but all is focused on the markets. The missions of these companies um, are, are, are thought based on serving the worldwide markets. It's a denominator and is simply a copy, copy paste from the, what each of the companies publishes. If we move ahead and try to do the same exercise with the NOCs, we found that all of them, and I emphasize two, just to, to, for the sake of, of, of time, uh, that they always emphasize the support to the national economy. 
uh, I, as an example, the mission of NOC before the Arab Spring, because I imagine they didn't update the site yet, um, is supporting the national economy and so and so. If you go to KPC, for instance, is ensuring the optimal exploitation of Q8 uh, hydrocarbon resources. If you go to Sonangol, another one is uh, the catalyst of national development meeting its responsibility with the state. So all of them focus their mission in, in um, extracting the most value of the resources that nature left in their territory. So which is two completely different missions. And now as I will try to conclude, the um, challenges, challenges of, of the players of this business is to try and converge and complement the responsibilities of the companies in this, in this area. There are, uh, in the meantime, there were companies that developed, and we ourselves in Galp Energy have passed through this phase, um, which are an hybrid between the two. We call these companies the ones that were the state as a, that are publicly quoted, so in a way they have responsibility to shareholders. Their roots is an, an, an NOC, uh, and still the state basically uh, appoints the CEO, is the one that runs the business uh, in all the ultimate conditions. And the missions are an hybrid. Uh, if you, and I'm sure that they did not agree with each other. So if you look at the missions of these companies, they are in between the two types of missions I referred to you before. For instance, I, I read Statoil. We are committed to the accommodation of the world energy needs in a responsible manner. Another one, say Kogaz, is providing clean, safe, and convenient energy to the people of Korea. This one focus on the country, and others are here just for record. So I try to, to with, with, with this simple exercise, try to share with you the, the, where the minds and aspirations of the leadership of these corporations are, and uh, which is extremely important in order to, to um, understand their positioning in, in businesses and in, in setting up partnerships. Then we move the head, and uh, we, we as a recent study by Accenture, they tried to qualify the attributes of the value drivers of IOCs and uh, NOCs. And uh, without going into detail, uh, they say from this, actually this is a, not a research, it's basically an inquiry, they, they have concluded that the, as it is obvious, that the IOCs have their focus on shareholders' return, on total shareholder return, and fundamentally their, their KPIs are linked to financial performance. The ultimate KPI is linked to financial performance. Is the return on average capital employed, is the EBITDA, all the, the financial variables that characterize the performance of a company. Uh, obviously in a sustainable manner. That's uh, fundamentally what they concluded from these inquiries to the CEOs of many, many uh, EOCs. The NOCs, uh, the similar exercise by the same entity using a similar inquiry, they concluded that their focus is on stakeholder value. And there is a, a, a major difference between return and, and value. They could be they could be similar, but they are not the same. When people think of creating value in their minds is creating wealth on the long term. When people think in shareholders returns is presenting good quarterly results. So and these are the, the which because we are measured, evaluated, so the key KPI is the performance of the shares and uh, which is basically maximizing return to the shareholders that could come either from the form of dividends or from the, the value of the shares themselves, while the other set of companies are concerned with uh, stakeholder, not shareholder, but stakeholder value by then meaning fundamentally, fundamentally creating value on the long-term basis consistent with their mission, as I tried to summarize to you before. Then, I'm, I'm nearly complete from telling you what I was told to tell, no? um, is, is uh, that what are the trends that are behind the thinking uh, of today's IOCs, and obviously there are no two equal IOCs, it's, uh, it's, um, it's uh, 
a temptation to generalize, but they are totally, they have totally different DNAs, and hence they are different. But in general terms, uh, the IOCs are focused on, uh, on investing in technology. If you go to the research and development programs of the IOCs, they are, uh, they, they, the numbers talk by themselves. They, uh, and they are, as, uh, as have been said this morning, they um, are um, basically uh, on the frontier, ex frontier exploration, both in terms of geological frontier and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the geographical frontier. It's basically for new, new areas assessing hard to reach areas. Uh, in the other component of the value chain refining, uh, what the IOCs are doing is uh, are basically reducing their exposure uh, to the business in the OECD countries. Reason is because demand is stagnant and the margins are being compressed and they are moving away for investing in, in other components of the value chain. In the more in the downstream of the downstream in distribution and marketing, they fundamentally are now focusing on reducing the capital employed. This business uh, employs a lot of capital. There are a lot of financial engineering, uh, engineering being done to reduce this exposure to, to, to capital. And they are also basically withdrawing slowly from the, the mature markets to the emerging markets. That's what the IOCs are, are, are basically doing, uh, seeing it in broad terms. The NOCs, they are very consistent. They are, I've, I've been sitting in, the, in, the, in my chair this morning, and every person that talks on behalf of NOC always talks about growth from two to four million barrels, from two to six. So they are very focused on production growth. And um, um, none of them said they were, they were focusing in the, uh, with the except of Statoil, which is a hybrid saying I'm going to increase the return, uh, my results from X to Y. They were focused on volumetric growth, uh, having as a basic assumption that is the way of moving, uh, creating wealth in the country that, uh, that, uh, that they serve. Uh, obviously, profitability is an issue, but is profitability for the country, not necessarily for the for the is 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 basically. And I remember when I worked in petroleum Venezuela in the good old times before the present political regime, where profitability was measured before taxes. That's what the criteria is. I remember I was for a while uh, planning and control manager, and uh, we would we would stop our thinking process before the tax, because we consider tax as a, as a way of distributing dividends. So we worked in a pre-tax or a non-tax environment for the strategic thinking point of view. So profitability is there, but has a different meaning. Uh, profitability for an IOC tax is a major issue. Uh, for an NOC tax is a non-issue, is a non-issue. Um, uh, obviously, they are trying to grow reserves, not for the same reasons as the IOCs, um, they are trying to grow reserves to ensure they can have a long-term plan for using, for producing their resources, and um, and uh, to have a ranking, to be well ranked in the world, in the world hierarchy of the uh, resource owners. That so is a is a state duty, as I've heard sometimes, that we need to know what the country owns in order to plan the, its use for generations to come. Uh, this is not the, the IOCs try to preserve the uh, reserve to production ratio to make sure that uh, that they are they are the adequate, theoretically uh, the proven reserves of of uh, IOC are the ones needed for the development projects that they have uh, they have at hand. The NOCs always had an ambition for international expansion, although some are more advanced than others, but also. Uh, even if it is a minor operation internationally, but it was uh, basically to try to understand how the market goes, what happens on the other side of the fence. Um, uh, uh, and obviously they, they, they have been, uh, because they are accused, most of them, of operational inefficiencies, and you can see that they, if you talk with them, all of them, they will try to demonstrate they are doing everything they can to achieve operational excellence and, uh, and the value, value chain integration. 
the next one is too obvious, I'll skip it. And then this one. This one is uh, this and the following graph. Try to understand the fundamental structured difference between IOCs and, uh, and, uh, o, o, and NOCs. Uh, uh, we, I, I, I had this, obviously, this, 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 this idea in my, in my mind, but then the numbers talk more than words. Is a, a IOC is basically a company that is, is, is grows from the market to the reservoir. The NOCs grows from the reservoir to the market. Try, let us try to, to see where that is the, the case. Take Shell as an example. Uh, Shell produces, and I'm talking about liquids, uh, produces 1.5 million barrels a day. Has a refining capacity which is much higher than the production capacity and, and sells more. So it goes, he has a wider market, uh, 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 so they, buy, they are net product buyers they, and they are net crude buyers uh, to process in their own refineries. It's a characteristic of all the IOCs. You look at Exxon, the same. 2.3 million barrels of liquids, you know, that this, I'm, I'm, it's just for, because if uh, some, the, some people here from these companies, they produce 4.5 million barrels, but the remaining is gas. So we are talking about the oil business. So 2.3, 6.2 refining capacity, 6.4 million barrels of sales, of product sales, uh, Chevron and, uh, and BP. So all of them have this concept uh, of structuring their, 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 in their integration. NOCs are just the opposite, just the opposite. Uh, they have more production, less refining, less market. Uh, uh, take, for instance, Petroleum Venezuela, even today, the, at least the published production is 3.1 million barrels. They have 2.8 million barrels of refining, 1.1 of market, and you go to, uh, to Saudi Aramco, you can go to Adnoc, you can go to KPC, but any other. So you, this is actually a general statement, which makes the clearly differentiates uh, the, the major um, difference between the corporations. So, and this is this difference that creates opportunities. You see, if they were uh, genet they, if genetically they have the same DNA, and if they had the same mission or, or similar missions, there was not opportunity for complementarity. And that's what creates opportunities for both the NOCs and the IOCs. And this is why events like this um, uh, potentially create value. Uh, the, the, this one shows is a research from the St Stanford University, is a, like an academic paper, that went through, like academicians are able to do, from 1991 to 2011, and looked at the value of the partnerships that exists between NOCs and IOCs. And, uh, I tell you, 75% of those are in ENP. Uh, they classified it in gas ENP, uh, oil ENP, oil and gas ENP, and LNG. All of these, I consider them ENP. They are approximately 75%. And the remaining 25% are, are, are on, on, on other activities like EOR, uh, FG upgrading, FG upgrade, refining, petrochemicals, GTL, you know, gas processing, and products marketing. So you can see that the, 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 there is a cooperation in all components of the value chain, but mostly focused on ENP. Now, back to my CV. What did I learn uh, in the relationship between IOCs, NOCs, and the in-betweens? The first is trust. Uh, it is extremely simple to pronounce, it's a few words, uh, extremely difficult to build and maintain and preserve. And that is to be, uh, whoever is in each side, it side has to have practices and, um, and, um, and values that put trust on the top list of the fundamentals of the relationship. That trust has to be personal relation. Trust that the, comes from personal relationships at different levels of the corporation. It is not only needed at the top level, not, not only the CEO, not only the board member, but even the geologists, the operators, they have to trust each other like colleagues. They have, and then trust on relationship, but trust also on operations. I trust 
that what happens is what happens on the ground is what I've been told, is transparency that is clearly focused on trust. Um, as a little example, uh, and I'll refer to that uh, partnership later, uh, we have set up uh, recently an operational partnership with Sinopec, and we made absolutely sure that we were totally transparent with, uh, with all the operational data so that they can understand the quality of the information that we share. Uh, another is true cooperation. Cooperation uh, is like we, when we deal with our children. Helping a son or a daughter is not doing what we want, that is, what we think is good for them. Is, is trying to see his or her aspirations and helping them to achieve that. That is helping them. Um, cooperation is the same thing. Is not doing what we think is cooperation, but trying to understand what really are the needs and ambitions of the other partner and help them to do that, not to do what I want. That's uh, true, true cooperation. And uh, that is not an, a simple exercise, again. Uh, another is that uh, when we start looking at the roles of each party in a, in a, in a partnership, uh, is like a marriage. They cannot, although now there is more marriage between the people of the same sex, the reality, in my generation, those things didn't exist. But the, the, this is they have to have complementary roles. We cannot set up a partnership in which both have similar or, or competitive roles. They have to be complementary. What do I do? What do you do? And, uh, and, and they, they should be well coupled. And in, in defining that uh, is of extremely value if we have always in mind the mission of the parties. Uh, you see, try to let the other party have a role that is aligned with, with their view of the business. And let us, the complementary party, to do something that is aligned with his view of the business. And do everything you can. I, and I can assure you that I've tried, tried, I try to do it, to do, to do it every, in every opportunity I have to create win-win conditions. Uh, a deal, uh, I've been a trader in my little, my career for a period of time, and we do a deal and we don't know even the face of the person, the other, par the other party of the trade business. A partnership is not, is not a one deal. It's not that we celebrate when we sign the contract or we execute completion. That is the point of starting the partnership. And, and then it has to be nurtured, it has to be supported, it has to be win-win for the parties. So even when we announce a partnership, we must be very careful. We cannot say, because if we say it's because we believe, that I've done a fantastic transaction. Uh, if I have done a fantastic transaction, it is because the other party has not done a good transaction. So it's what we have to aspire is doing a good deal, a fair deal. And uh, uh, UBS referred that they were our, um, re that they uh, helped us in a recent transaction, and our ambition was throughout the process and, uh, and uh, that we should do a fair deal, a deal that is good, because that was, I repeat it again, it was the starting point of a relationship and not the end game. Now, now uh, a little bit, so that's what I learned uh, in, my, in my professional life. Now, back to Galp in Gia. By the way, Galp means Portugal. is a, is a, is a, a nickname for Portugal. If you put the P before the G, is is Portugal, uh, or Petrogal, as others could call it. Uh, we are essentially a Portuguese-speaking ENP country, ENP company. There's not many companies that classify themselves like that, because our major assets are in Portugal, in offshore Portugal, apart from the downstream business in Portugal, Spain, and Africa. We also are in Angola, in Mozambique, in Brazil, and East Timor. We, have, we are present in three Spanish-speaking countries because we understand well the Spaniards. When they speak Spanish, we understand them. It's Uruguay, Venezuela, and the Equatori Equatorial Guinea. Uh, I will refer to the most uh, important uh, partnerships that we have in place today. All of them uh, um, uh, relationships based on trust, on trying to be constantly in creating win-win conditions uh, with uh, between uh, ourselves and the company that represents the host company. The host company. Uh, I'll start with this Timor. 
East Timor is a small little country which one, with one million inhabitants, which has recently created the, the first national oil company. They didn't have that. They have simply the Ministry of, of, uh, of Energy, which is called, by the way, Timor Gap. But Gap not from the, not to translate the litigation that is well known between East Timor and Australia, but Gap is for gas and petroleum. So it's Timor Gas and Petroleum Company, which they named simply Timor Gap. You all know the contentions that exist between the two countries. As soon as it was created, we clearly understood that this Timor being a small country, uh, is a Portuguese speaking country, uh, with strong and, uh, uh, links to, the, to, to Portugal. Um, and we started work with them. We don't have any business with the Timor, with Timor Cap. We have, we have no business. We don't know whether we will have one or not, but we are already working with them, uh, helping them in putting together a good organizational structure, procedures for management the company, uh, because we think we have that duty towards that small country that has ambitions to be a small, but uh, for them, extremely important role. And will we get one day some business there? Probably will. But we have to deserve it. But in order to deserve, we have to position ourselves in, in, in a place to deserve it. They, will, they are intelligent enough, experienced enough, not to give anything away to anybody. Uh, but if you, if you position ourselves as... So, so that phase of, of cooperation is to, the phase of building trust. Uh, to building trust for them to understand that we have cultures, values that could be aligned. Mozambique. Everybody talks about Mozambique. We've been in Mozambique since 1957, so for a long time. We have downstream operations there, and we are there. Uh, the company knows us. Obviously, ENH, they've got two oil companies. One is called Petromoc, which is the downstream company. Another, ENH, which is the upstream company. Obviously, we have good relationships with them. We have no immediate, we have our position in Area 4 in the Rovuman project. It is a, is a world-class, high-value project. But um, if we want to be there for another 50 years, we, uh, now that Mozambique is going to, the, to be a, a world reference uh, in, the, in, the gas, in, the, in the gas business, we need to start from scratch in building that trust creating win-win conditions, and we are doing that. We are working hard with the ENH to support them, obviously, with a different, different program that we have with, with, with Timor Gap. They are in a completely different stage of, of maturity, but they need, they need something. They need a party that puts values before business. And then, if business comes in a win-win condition, that's fantastic. Um, uh, Angola, Mozambique, Angola, sorry. Angola, we've been dead also for probably you, not many people know that Angola results from, Son Angola results from the nationalization of Angola. Angola used to be a subsidiary of GALP. You know? So we maintain in our deep relationship with Son Angola today. We receive in our company their, their human resources teams to understand how we work. We share things that have apparently no economic value, but those are the seeds to consolidate our presence in Angola. But I skip to what is an exemplary and unique relationship that we managed to build, thanks to both parties, is the relationship that we built with Petrobras. Petrobras is a, a company that I admire a lot, not only from their professionalism, for their being a state-controlled company, but have a, a, an ambitious, an ambitious mind, an ambitious projects, and uh, with a, 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 um, a fantastic research and development project that supports their growth. Their growth is supported not only on reserves but also on knowledge. Knowledge comes from major investments of, of, of in research and development. By the way, if anybody has any doubt about it, ask any. Uh, any employee from Petrobras to visit their research center, and it is unequivocally the most well equipped, both in human capital and in material capital, uh, in the in the oil industry, oil and gas industry. So it's, that is Petrobras, and uh, and we managed to build 
uh, a, a relationship with Petrobras with 20 partnerships in Brazil uh, and nine outside Brazil. So nearly 30 partnerships, both all, all based on trust, on complementarity, and we always try to say, what can I do from my knowledge base, from my financial base, that can add value to the partnership? Uh, most, most of the times I cannot do much, so that is the role for Petrobras. But there, if it, there is a little niche where I can be better than Petrobras, we do it. And I think how, how the relationship should be based. So in short, in short, uh, we have, in, by a little example to, to, to conclude, we, um, we uh, needed to have a, a primary equity issue last year that we come to in order to to balance our balance sheet, because we, we today we produce slightly below 30,000 barrels a day, and we have a growth program with the existing project to take us to at least 300,000 barrels a day, so it's a tremendous uh, derivative in growth. And uh, we need to have a strong balance sheet to face, uh, to face safely that journey of growth. To do that, we issued new shares in our subsidiary in Brazil, in a international competitive process, and that those shares were subscribed by Sinopec. Um, the way how we do it, we didn't have at all to talk with Petrobras, neither with Petrobras nor with, with, with the government of Brazil. No, no not at all. But um, I can assure you now that the transaction is, is, has been closed, that in the process of selecting the party, negotiating the agreements, I kept informed the CEO of Petrobras and the board member responsible for the area and the Minister of Energy and Mines. Why that, if I was not contractually nor legally obliged to do that? Because in my interpretation, they trusted us to be their partners. So if I was changing the rules of that relationship, if I was changing the shareholder structure of that legal entity, which is uh, GALP in Brazil, I wanted to make sure that my partner understood why I was doing it, first. Second, was in agreement with the steps that, uh, that uh, I needed. I didn't need that agreement at all, from, neither from the legal nor con contractual point of view, but that is, uh, I think, the substance of maintaining and preserving trust. Today, we operate in Brazil successfully. We have uh, uh, an operator partner, which is Sinopec, with which we are trying to apply the same concept without affecting the high quality relationship that we have with Petrobras. So that's basically, my good friends, what I have to share with you. Uh, and I conclude repeating what I've told you many times throughout my, my words, is that is unavoidable. The deepening of the relationships between NOCs and IOCs is unavoidable. Uh, is there, is there for us to read, then some will succeed, others will fail. And the key to success is trying to be complementary, uh, complementary and, um, and uh, create win-win deals, uh, long-term based win-win deals. Thank you for your attention.